Thank you. Uh, before I start, I just want to uh, say a few words that we lost a good friend of the flight simulator community this year. Uh, Bob Sidwick was the one who brought us Laminar to Cosport the first time, I think three or four years ago. Mm. Yeah, he was, he was the guy who uh, told Marty, hey, you really need to come over to Cosport and the UK has a great flight sim community. And I think he was one of the first persons uh, to uh, be really passionate about flight simulation. He was always into trying new things, trying explain, trying VR. He made the um, VR-based uh, explain simulator for the air cadets. Mm. And yeah, we were very sad to hear that in, uh, <coughs> earlier this year he, he passed away. And it's the first time we are in Cosport and Bob is not here. So um, yeah, I just want to take the opportunity to <laughs> Thank you. All right, so uh, we are Lamina Research, and uh, we, that is on the stage here, Thompson and me, and of course there's a lot more people working in the background. Uh, last time I checked, we are close to 30 people now working on X-Plane. Um, naturally, not all of us can come over uh, for a show like this, so you've got I say only the best ones get to go, I think only the best ones get to the shows. All right, so let me give you a brief introduction to explain and what explain is. And um, right here in the center, this is what started explain. And that's what, that's what made Austin start explain over 20 years ago in 1996. And that's the, that's the flight dynamics. So in 1996, a young Austin Meyer failed his instrument proficiency check because he didn't get to fly an airplane very much. He was a college student at the time, didn't have much money left over to, to take uh, lessons. And he failed his instrument proficiency check and he was so frustrated with it that he said, oh, there's gotta be a way that I can train for it better at home. And he had some kind of Apple, whatever, old home computer at the time. And he wrote the first, first version of X-Plane in 96 in his college dorm room. And uh, he laid the foundation for the flight model that we use until today. And over the past 20, 24 years that x has been growing, it, the, the flight model gained a lot of friends. Um, uh, the great uh, external rendering, phys physics-based rendering that we have in x 11, which allows for great aircraft, great looking scenery, um, all the, the gateway airports, the over 10,000 3D airports with all accurate buildings that come with X-Plane now. Um, the avionics that come as standard in the X-Plane default aircraft that allow you to fly IFR. <laughs> then um, two years ago we got VR, virtual reality, X-Plane to drive virtual reality headsets. Um, we got a great user interface. x was infamous for being very, very complicated to set up and get going, and I think we solved that in x 11 with a great new user interface. Um, so a new, recent new friends of x are uh, the landmark sceneries. We actually started two years ago with London. I think London was the first city um, in x to gain uh, custom-made landmarks. It's been many more cities since, since that. FMOD, the new sound system, which allows you to create really cinematic sound effects for uh, airplane and, and, and explain. And then of course our ever growing collection of Lego bricks, as we call them, the default objects that designers can use to make those awesome airports. <coughs> so this is explain and friends as we ship it. And um, of course, explain is open to third parties, so we are very uh, proud to see so many studios um, bring their content to explain. So of course, Orbix with um, uh, True Earth Great Britain is um, a, a recent new new addition to explain that looks absolutely fantastic. And then of course, um, Just Flight is bringing a lot of their aircraft over to over to explain, like, like the Duchess here or the Piper Standard Warrior. I think it's an Archer. Uh, Piper Archer. So there's lots of great third-party content that is being created for Explain 
day, day in and day out because X-Plane is, is very open to third parties to create aircraft, to create plugins, to create scenery, airports, and so on. So this is just a small overview of, uh, of what we have. All right, this is X-Plane as you have it, and um, I will now talk about what is coming to explain for the rest of the year. So of course we are in the process of 1140 beta right now and I'm going to talk about all this stuff that is in 1140, especially the, the flight model. So this has again been in a release where we let Austin run wild and do, do a lot of things in, in the physics of explain, which I think is what explain really is all about in the end. And um, a lot of these changes in the flight model came from making real-world aircraft because Austin has been involved in making real-world, full-scale, with people in it, <laughs> aircraft size and, and designing those, uh, designing this, this new aircraft led to um, changes in X-Plane so that the new aircraft, the predictions of X-Plane were within the accuracy of the sensors that they had on the real plane. In other words, the errors that came from having the sensors on the real plane were on the same order as um, the accuracy that the simulation could provide. And then, of course, everyone's been asking, hey, what's the status of Vulcan? I have this great new 2070 RTX graphics card, and it's idling, and my graphics card is twiddling thumbs and not doing much. And yeah, when are you going to do something about that? So yeah, I'm going to talk about that. All right, but first, before I get to that, um, first up is um, X-Plane Mobile. So it's a very important platform for us because it allows us to keep developing the major versions of X-Plane that you get every like three or four years. And, and in between, we have all these people working on X-Plane. We really need to do more than just release a desktop version every three or four years. And X-Plane Mobile allows us to um, create a lot of technology that is not only used on mobile, but that is also um, good for the desktop version as well. So this is what X-Plane Mobile looked like when it came out for the original iPhone. Oh, I think it's the iPhone 3G, so that is 2008. So that is what you could get on an iPhone of 2008. So the scenery is kind of mad. The instruments are, well, I mean, yeah, they are easy to read, but not very realistic. And the, 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 the problem back then was you could do very, very, you had very little code overlap between what you could do on an iPhone and what you could do on a real computer. And that has changed over the past 10 or 11 years. So nowadays, the code share between the mobile version and the desktop version of X-Plane is close to uh, three quarters. I think by now it's over, over 75%. And that means for you, uh, how many of you use X-Plane Mobile or Infinite Flight or, or a mobile flight simulator? Okay, so I want you to do it. All right, okay. So what that means for you, for all the rest who didn't raise their hand right now, what that means to them is, 75% of the newest stuff we develop for putting it into mobile also works on desktop. So, it, so you are profiting from that as well. So if I show you this screenshot, is this explain desktop or is it explain mobile? That's a trick question because it's the same. So this is the explain desktop 737 running on explain mobile and all the switches are working. You can switch on the, the APU generator, you can switch on the anti-ice, you can switch on the pitot heat, you can switch on the fuel pumps. Everything that works on mobile as well. Uh, you can even program the FMS on mobile. It, it works. It is the same FMS as in the desktop version. So, um, and in fact, some things that uh, are interesting for the hardcore uh, simmers, like new autopilot modes that I developed last year, and that people are using on desktop, I develop them for mobile because Chris asked me, hey, we need a better autopilot in mobile. But I don't care if it ends up in mobile or it ends up in the desktop. It's just a better system. So yeah, so the, the model systems are the same whether you run them on iPad or whether you run them in a desktop simulator. The, the interaction with the 3D cockpit is the same. You can touch the switch on your iPad and the, the, the interacts the, the, the same system. And that's why I say we're the only mobile flight simulator that runs desktop quality aircraft, and that's what it looks like. So we got the 172 with the same Garmin GPSs that you have in the, in, 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 in the desktop version. 
So that's what it looks like right now. I explain mobile has five regions where you can fly. And that's very economical because you can fly for tens of miles. It doesn't use very much fuel because you can only make short trips. And you don't need to spend much time in cruise because you can't fly very far. So you have those great airliners, but you don't really get much use out of them. So that's why we're coming to explain global, which really is global. We've got all 30 something thousand airports in the world in the mobile scenery. So all of US obviously, and here all of the UK. And it's not just those 30,000 airports of the world. It is also all the 10,000 3D airports with accurately placed buildings that we have on the desktop version come to the mobile version as well. So we got auto-generated cities and towns, which uses the same autogen technology as the desktop version. And as I said, ten, ten, more than 10,000 uh, uh, 3D airports. And the scenery it comes from the cloud, but you can download the scenery onto your phone and then go on a long flight while you don't have internet and still fly because you uh, downloaded the scenery to your phone. So that's what it looks like. You've got the map and then you create a flight plan. <laughs> and when you're, when you're done creating the flight plan, you pack it up. And even if you lose your internet connection on the go, you can c continue flying because you downloaded the scenery to your phone. And then that's what it looks like. This is a screenshot from uh, the iPhone version. That's, that's what it looks like. So yeah, this is, this is the kind of processing power and graphics power that we get from an iPhone nowadays. So uh, this is uh, auto-generated New York City and uh, auto-generated Chicago. And as I said, we have the 3D airport. So this is the Atlanta airport. And even if you go down on the, on the details, the jetways are there, the vehicles are there, all the lines and markings and everything, it's the same scenery. Uh, Providence, also Gateway Airport. Amsterdam, same thing. And a small airport that I have actually no idea where that is, called Foxtrot Lima, I have no idea. But let me show you. Uh, so this is what the airport looks like uh, if you watch it on, on, on Google Earth. And if you compare the layout between Google Earth and the, uh, uh, the, the, the gateway scenery, it is, it is the same. It is really recognizable that the buildings are all in the right place. So the um, explain Glomo, Global Mobile, is in uh, private beta right now. So a couple of days ago, we sent out a Google form through our social media outlets where you could sign up saying, hey, got my iPhone, whatever, 11 or XR or whatever, or I have an Android uh, Honor or whatever they are called. So we are collecting now uh, people using, using different devices and they are running the, the private beta now. And then once we are sure it runs, on, on, runs great on all devices, then we're going to open the beta up to the public soon. All right, let's uh, take a look what ships with XPEN 1140. XPEN 1140 is a free update for everyone who has uh, XPEN. And I already talked about it in, in mobile. Um, we got a lot of more airports again. So this slide is basically every year just, just going up and up how many airports we have. So we had 4,500 uh, handmade 3D airports. And, uh, we were like, OK, that's probably it. That's I mean, how more? How much more can you really get? And then a year later, it was over seven thousand, and, and and this year it's eleven thousand eight hundred uh, main airports in in eleven forty. And eleven forty comes with fourteen hundred airports that have never been in Xpeng before, so they are all new. And as of yesterday, when I last checked, um, seven thousand three hundred and twenty-seven people have been making one or more sceneries for x -Plane. So at this point, I want to say a thank you to the gateway artists. Maybe some of you who are here also use Word Editor. So at this point, I say thank you to everyone who uses Word Editor. And it's one of those 7,300 people that make x scenery. Great. 
yeah, that's that's what those airports look like. Um, Copenhagen, uh, Los Angeles. Yep, that's LA. Chicago. Uh, Reno. Yeah, and I think oh, I think you missed the the first one. Uh, that one. Which one is that? Gatwick. There you go. All right, you got it. Yeah, that's that's definitely Gatwick. You got it. Um, so see, even even without custom objects, it's really possible to create the feel of the airport. So then I show you one screenshot, and the audience just immediately says. Yeah. All right, and so speaking of objects, a new set of objects that we just shipped in 1135 is all those boats. So for all airports close to the water, you can now put a marina there and put all the, uh, put all the, the boats there. And if you look closely, like we have the Jennifer here, so every, everyone, in, everyone in X-Plane, everyone who works in X-Plane is on a boat name or a road sign somewhere. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that's the tool. Uh, we are running the beta right now of Word Editor 2.2, and 2.1 is the, the stable version uh, that you use to create airports. And it is really uh, what you see is what you get. Editor that I think it's the easiest scenery creation tool there is um, <coughs> to to just get into uh, making airports, making all the signs that you see. On, on the airport, making all the lines. We've got great new um, textures, great new artwork, so you can create exactly the right taxiway markings and everything. All right, stay uh, with the scenery for a bit. Um, those are probably not going to ship in 1140 because they are still a work in progress. So I put 1150 there, not quite sure. Maybe we do it 1145 to, to drop them in. So who recognizes that tower? Where is that? LA. LA, you got it. All right, so uh, um, that's the custom made LA. I don't think the, the place is really called Austin's, but as you say, <laughs> as I said, we always have uh, our names somewhere. Of course, uh, with night lighting as well. Uh, I got the observatory the uh, LA Convention Center. And this really nice rooftop bar. And of course, well, everything looks great at night as well with all those uh, um, tens of thousands or probably hundreds of thousands of light sources in x -Plane. So uh, one of our developers calls, says that x is not really a flight simulator, x it's more of a light simulator. <laughs> Um, we got San Francisco as the next city that gets uh, custom landmarks. So we had someone go wild on making all the bridges, the Golden Gate Bridge, Bay Bridge, and what else there is. Uh, so if you uh, if you stop using Xplane and go back to using FSX, we put you there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's the, that's the Bay Bridge, and just a view from from San Francisco. Uh, down to, I think, that's Fisherman's Wharf down there. And uh, Fairman Tower, is that what it's called? Fairman Tower? I don't know. I think it's just such a long time ago. All right, so this is all visual. This is all about things you can see. But what we're also dropping into um, future x is things that you can hear. So we got great new aircraft sounds that we ship this year and I'm going to give you a preview of aircraft sounds that are going to ship soon. So earlier this year we um, made the new sound set for the King Air that we actually recorded um, not only on <coughs> King Air but also on, on Austin's aircraft because it has the exact same kind of engine so we could get Austin to get the engine through all its regimes and take a record of all of that. And yeah, just let me show you how the sound works now. Uh, just let me show you how it sounds. <coughs> Fuel pumps. <coughs> Starter, igniter. And 
क्यों close to my heart because it's not only great sound but it also interacts with the rest of the simulator so great so I can set up in uh, with the new joystick curve feature I can set up my my throttle to have the beta range down there and I don't even need to look what the simulator is doing I can hear when the prop goes into beta just just by the characteristic sound it makes when the prop hits its own weight when it's flat and and the sound allows allows me to, um, to just fly by ear. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so what we are shipping um, after this? So this came out earlier this year, and uh, we're not exactly sure when we're going to ship the MD80. And uh, yeah, we put it together a quick video just showing all the sounds in the cockpit, and I want you to see that really every single switch in the cockpit has a characteristic sound. Right, you can open the window and then you get the outside. <laughs> you should not do this on the car. <laughs> <laughs>
the sound really interacts with the world around you. You can open the, the rear door, in, in, you can walk down the virtual cab and open the rear door and suddenly you hear the APU blasting away. And what's interesting about the MD82, because the engines are so far in the back, is that in the cockpit, you don't really hear them very much. So it is actually, the, the, the engine start is actually not quite spectacular because you can see it on the gauges and then you hear the air conditioning become louder when you open up the bleed air, but there's really not that much sound from, from, from the engines up in the cockpit, unless you open the window, of course, as, as you just saw. So, and the, the sound is based on the simulation of the aircraft. So for example, you heard when you started up the King Air, when you switch on the starter, it does two things. It engages the starter motor that turns the core, and you also hear the igniter go tick, 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 to, to, to ignite the, uh, the fuel as it, as it is injected. And just, just to give you an idea of what is behind that sound, the ticking frequency of the igniter depends on how long it takes to charge the capacitor that fires off that spark. And that capacitor takes longer to charge when you have a lower battery voltage. So if you start one engine from the battery, it's going to go tick, tick, tick. And then if you start the other engine from the generator of the first engine, it's going to go tick, 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 because it has more voltage. And you're actually able to hear that. So this is um, great, especially in VR. If you have a headset that has the um, that has headphones mounted to it, like like the Odyssey headset we are using, um, it really adds to the immersion. It adds to the being there, the feeling of being there. If you tilt your head around and you look somewhere else, and the sound changes as you move your head in the virtual space. So it's really really awesome for for VR. And as I said, it's driven based on a lot of systems that we have put into x 1135. So the fuel system, not only does the, it make a sound if you flip a switch. I mean, everyone can program a sound that works when you flip a switch, but it, it actually works with the fuel system that is new in x 1135. Um, same, same for the, for the bleed air. When you turn on the pack, uh, it'll actuate the valve. You can have the failure for the valve, and and, and de uh, depending on how much um, N1 your your engine is turning, it will change the amount of bleed air that is put out, and that can be used by the tax, and that is going to change the sound of the air conditioning that you hear. Um, yeah, so in the bleed air consumption then again affects the engine output. So if you turn on wing NTIs, engine NTIs, and take all the bleed air away, uh, your EGT is going to increase, and that means you can extract less power from the aircraft. So, and, and the APU, again, it's not just the sound, it's just, it's a, a new simulation that is, that is, that is behind that. Um, yeah, this is all really specific stuff that I don't want to go too deep into. Um, just that, yeah, I already told you it changes with the battery condition, you can hear that. Oh, and this is kind of a big thing because we've been getting, uh, always getting uh, real pilots asked about that, whether it, it didn't work quite right. Um, in the new default 172, we got a non-rigid, no split steering. So if you've ever looked at how the steering of the real 172 works, it's you go get into the rudder pedal, but the rudder pedal is not actually rigidly connected to the nose wheel. Instead, what it does, it, it um, puts um, pressure on a bungee, on, on a bungee cord that then pulls on the nose wheel. And the steering angle that you get with the, with the rudder pedals is actually only about 10 degrees, but then you can, on top of that, actuate differential brakes, like put the brakes on a little bit on one side, and then that's going to pull the airplane around, and the nose wheel swivels just as it needs to, to, to make this tighter turn. And we got that simulated in x 1136, I think. Um, yeah, so if you got actual pedals, if you got hardware pedals that have um, toe brakes, then you can actually taxi the 172 now exactly as it, as it does in the real airplane. So, x 1140 is in beta right now. You can uh, grab the beta right now and get all the 
uh, the flight model improvement. So that gets me into the um, changes that have been going on in the X-1011 flight model. So as you know, we're we are all pilots and um, we have a slightly different approach to taking risks when it comes to flying. So for example, that's my face when we're about to enter this thunderstorm <laughs> that we're going to fly through. Austin takes it a little differently. That's uh, <laughs> his impression right before we go in there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, this is, this is Austin's aircraft, that's what the interior shots were from. Uh, it's a home-built, uh, custom-made uh, lens air, he calls it the revolution. Um, and of course, a lot of the things that you just heard about, the, the, the turboprop, I mean, it's the same turboprop engine as is in the King Air. So the simulation became really, really accurate just because Austin has the same engine on his own plane and keeps tweaking X-Plane to behave exactly the same. Right, but Austin has recently been into developing this kind of strange looking thing here, which is an electrically powered vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, an electric VTOL that has, has those big, big rotors here that are driven by eight electric motors that are distributed um, all over the plane. And it's, it's a real thing, it's not a mock-up, it actually flies, that's what it looks like when you let it loose. So this is not a mock, it's a first image flying it. So in this contraption was developed first in X-Plane before they started bending any metal and screwing any parts together and starting to build electric motors. It was first built in X-Plane to prove that it could be done and then they threw that together and compared the results that they got from the real thing with what they got from X-Plane and then they started um, once, once they had the prototype, um, initially it was on a rope and they let it connect it to the rope, just lift like two, three, feet, four feet up in the air while being, being connected to the rope. And that's um, when they started making a flight control software that controls the RPM of those eight electric motors all around the plane. And that flight control software was developed in X-Plane and, and then later put into, into, into this aircraft. And during the development of, um, of the AVA electric VTOL, um, of course they discovered things that x didn't quite do exactly as um, the, the real thing turned out to be. So what you are getting with x -Plane, X -Plane 1140 is everything they found out um, doing that. For example, the prop wash swirl. And right now, of course, this thing has eight props. and two props behind one another. So one prop sucks up the air that already has the swirl from the prop that's above it. Um, so a lot of work has gone into the interaction of parts. So we always say the only oh, X-Plane flight model is perfect. <coughs> and so the question is, so what do you do to make it better if you already told us four years ago? That was absolutely <coughs> perfect. So where we can always get better is when it comes to the interaction of things with other things. So we are very good already at simulating air over a wing, or air through a propeller, or air over a stabilizer. And what really is happening here is, okay, the air gets first sucked through the propeller, that gives it a swirl, then the swirling air comes back over the wing, and after it hits the wing, then it hits the, horse, uh, the vertical stabilizer, but just from one side because there's no stabilizer on the bottom. So what this is getting into is getting all the interactions between the different parts right. x has always been very good about simulating the parts, and what we are getting really good at now is simulating the interaction of several parts after one, one after the other. So we got the prop wash over the tail. How much time does it take from when the air is affected by the prop until that 
piece of air hits your tail. Um, then the, the whole rotor that you saw there is quite a bit uh, of disc. And if that is moving through the air forward, um, what does that change? The, 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 the blade that goes up here um, has a different effect on the air than when the blade goes back here. And, and of course it has. So the prop motion varies across the prop disc as it, as it goes through the air. So all of this has gone into explain um, 1140. So you've got the, the, the wind delta over every element here. So what you can see here, this is the prop that grabs the air that has already been affected by that prop here. Uh, you can simulate the, the, the flow field, so, so where's, the, where's the air going and then what, what is the force across the prop disc? You can see here, I mean, this is one prop disc, but the, the, the uh, lift on this side is a lot closer. So this is the forward going blade than on the side of the, the retreating blade. And of course, that prop turns the other direction than the prop above it, so they, they, they are counter-rotating. And um, then of course, what does this to the air and then the flow of the air after the airplane goes down, at some point it hits the ground, then what happens when this air hits the ground? Well, obviously you are in ground effect and that changes um, the, the, the lift. Yeah? When, you are, when you're flying close to the ground and your downwash hits the ground, um, what that gives you is higher lift and, and lower induced drag. So all of that, it's a crazy concept, but what you can take away from it, it makes your explain better. That's as far as you're concerned, the job of this thing is to make you a better simulator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you we got on YouTube two videos of Austin uh, explaining all the changes that are in XPen 1140. They are kind of technical, and then he starts to talk about sine and cosine and algebra and math. So I'm not going to play those videos for you. Um, I just encourage you to look up x 1140 flight model. You'll find two long or moderately long, like 20, 30 minute videos on YouTube where Austin has the big whiteboard and explains all the things. So just as an overview, what we have in, in the 1140 beta is we have weight turbulence. So the AI airplanes that fly around in x planes world now leave a vague turbulence. So you can, you can put on flight model control M, the flight model visualization, and then as an AI plane goes by, you, you can see the wake that leaves those two rotating air masses that, that it leaves behind. And when you, you're with the user plane, you hit this, this air mass, it, it is not your, it's not binary like, oh, you're in the rotor or you're out of the rotor, no. Part of that moving air hits part of your wing, and part of your wing is dipped down or flipped up as you hit this this moving uh, this moving air. Yeah, we talked about downwash. We, we talked about delay. We talked about the, the variation across the disc. Um, one big improvement that is in X1140 is uh, seaplane physics because Austin flew an icon recently and took a lot of notes about what can be done uh, to make seaplanes work and explain better. And one big thing is uh, the change of uh, the wave shape, so the way the water interaction, the interaction between the water surface and the um, float, so the, the body, the part of the, 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 the body um, that is in the water that interacts with the water surface. So there, there have been a few changes there that makes it the, the feel of um, what, it, what it feels like if you have like a small like one foot wave, uh, what, what that does to, to the seaplane. So we got, uh, and I hope this is everything that's in 1140, but there might be more things that I just haven't discovered yet. So we got the trip stall, which greatly improves the stalling characteristic, especially of small aircraft. So the, once the flow separates, it used to be that in x the flow could be either laminar or separated. So, and, and, and now what happens, the flow separates, and then you have to, like in the real airplane, you need to nose down, you need to unload the wing, you need to get the angle of attack down to get the flow to reattach. And that happens at a lower angle of attack than what you can actually do when you pull back. So um, there's, there's a variation between the angle be when the flow detaches as opposed to what the angle of attack needs to be when the flow reattaches. 
Um, yeah, the rotor bounce back, that's a little bit comparable to ground effect. So what happens if you hover your helicopter close to the ground and the, the air you're pushing down hits the ground and it comes back? Um, per element thermal said something for the glider pilots. It used to be the glider was either in the thermal or out of the thermal. And that's not really realistic because glider pilots can feel the thermal when they put one wing into it. So if they notice, whoop, one wing goes up, they know, ah, the thermal on, is on this side. I just flew to it with my left wing tip. And x now does exactly the same thing. x has the, the, the randomly generated thermals and you can actually feel them because it's not the airplane going through it, it's each air and every single element of the wing that can be in the thermal or out of the thermal. Uh, yeah, vertical wind profile, that's something that came out of a wind turbine research paper of all the things. So what does the wind profile look like um, as you get closer and closer to the ground? So where is the wind measured? And the, f and the wind sock has a standard height, I think it's uh, 6 meters. And when, if we know that at the wind sock height, 6 meters over the ground, the wind is whatever, 270 at 10, what does that actually mean for the wind right close to the ground? Because it's not going to be the same, because the ground has a friction on, on the wind. Uh, yeah, exhaust thrust and turboprops. Of, of course, a turboprop engine turns the big prop that shoves a lot of air backwards, but it also has an exhaust flow, and that exhaust flow actually contributes a bit of thrust. And that's now also simulated. Yeah, weight turbulence, we talked about that. Uh, the transition from subsonic to supersonic flight has been improved. Um, supersonic planes that are area ruled, like the T-38, where the uh, fuselage gets narrower, it, it, where the wings are attached to, rem uh, to uh, preserve the, the cross-sectional area. That's called area ruling the plane. That's now something you can do in, in Plane Maker. Um, yeah, we got better simulation for, for T-tails versus double tails. Uh, we talked about improved seaplane physics. Yeah, of course, the plane that Austin constructed there is electric. So, of course, like, it's like a Tesla. It can do electric regen during the descent. When you're just flying forward, the air is turning the prop. You actually get uh, regenerative braking that way. And uh, so, so this is the environmentally friendly part, and this is the part that is not so environmentally friendly. <laughs> so if you want to burn lots of fuel instead, you can uh, use the improved afterburners, reheat in x 1140. Yeah, as I said, that's the, that's, the, that's the video with all the math explaining all what I just said, but in much, much greater detail. And if you want to spend 30 minutes learning about it, go on YouTube and look it up. All right, so this is the end of x 1140. Um, so all the flight model improvements that I just talked about are in 1140. It's a free update. And now, of course, we're going to talk about the next free update. So everything in this presentation, including the stuff that comes now, will come to x 11 as a free update. So we've heard about Vulcan and Metal, and everyone is there. When are we going to get it? Is it there? Can we get it? So this is what the Vulcan porting checklist looked like at Flight Sim Expo last year. That was kind of the things that are done, the things that were missing. Gla uh, happily, the to-do list right now looks pretty much like this. So all of those big animals are, uh, are, are done. So this is what we showed last year at FS Expo. It's Airfoil Maker running in Vulcan. Great. <laughs> doesn't help you very much unless you want to design airfoils with really, really good frame rate. I mean, <laughs> but that's what we, that's what we need to get, get started. So that's what it looks like right now. This is actually X-Plane running in Vulkan developer version. So we got that running, I think, about three months ago or so. So it's the first time that X-Plane run in, in Vulkan. And then, of course, Marty wanted to know how fast is it? How much? How much improves it? Uh, how much uh, does it improve the FPS? Um, so, a little disclaimer here: if your GPU is the problem, if your GPU is from 1998, like this one, uh, Vulkan <laughs> is not going to make Explain faster. Vulkan is about putting to use the modern good 
big GPUs. So if you have an uh, 1080 Ti or an RTX 2070 or RTX 2080, if you have a good GPU right now, that GPU is pretty bored by X-Plane. It can't, X-Plane can't really make use of it. And Vulkan allows us to put those GPUs to work really. But it's not going to make your eight-year-old GPU suddenly perform faster. That's not what it does. So the transition from uh, OpenGL to Vulkan looks a little bit like that. OpenGL is a very, very long spec and a very, very elaborate driver that tries to do a lot. But we are not. We don't know how fast it is. We don't. When we ask it to do something, it says, "All right, I'm going to do it." But we have no idea how long it's going to take. So Vulkan is a little bit different. Vulkan is a very small spec in a very, very thin driver sheet, uh, uh, driver uh, layer, and um, same thing, same thing for Metal. And they have very, very narrow things they need to do and for everything we ask them to do we know exactly how long it's going to take so uh, we need to do more work and explain that is true but since we have total control over how long everything takes it's still a net win so how far is it so we got an nvidia 9080 so uh, sorry 980 so it's like three generations ago so it's not even the super latest nvidia and we got low, high, and extreme settings. So extreme meaning really all the sliders all the way over to the right. And um, so this is the, the um, frame rate comparison of um, OpenGL versus Vulkan in all those three scenarios. So you can see Vulkan is consistently faster on NVIDIA than, than, than it was before. This, this might not look terribly impressive. So for the medium settings, we've gone from 60 to 70 frames. And on the extreme settings over here, maybe from 28 to 35. <laughs> so the total number has not gone up that much, but I'm going to show you later what has really gone up that does not show so much here in the frame rate. So if you are a member of the red team and you have an AMD card instead, uh, Vulkan is going to do a lot more for you. So, um, uh, x -Plane running Vulkan is significantly faster on AMD graphics cards, and that is because AMD always make great hardware. The, the AMD graphics cards are really, really great hardware, but their OpenGL driver just wasn't very good. And what Vulkan allows us is to extract the same power um, that previously only the NVIDIA drivers allowed us. So, if you have an AMD card and were kind of frustrated that it didn't perform as good as it could, well, with Vulkan it does. It, it, it is really a noticeable improvement uh, with Vulkan. All right, so can we maybe do even better? So, this is Seattle with our 737, so it's a kind of complex scenery because Seattle is a big airport with lots of objects. The 737 is a, an, an elaborate virtual cockpit with um, a lot of um, scripts running in the background and stuff. So this is the extreme settings on an RTX 2070. So you can see with all everything to the right, we have, we have in the worst case gone from about 24, 25 up to 30. Um, but we can actually do a little bit better. So over the last couple of weeks, um, Ben and Sydney have been working on improving uh, um, some mechanisms here that we call the, the, the quad tree. So we have, this is OpenGL. This is what you have right now. Then about five FPS, five to 10 FPS above that we have Vulcan. And on top of that, the green, this is what we are running now. This is Vulcan and another improvement in, in the back end that allows us to um, uh, retain more cache coherence and, and just let the CPU get to a certain data faster than, than fetching it from, from main memory. So, and as you can see, the, the gap gets even wider when you turn uh, away from the airport. So this is kind of your worst case scenario. This is looking right at the uh, through the airport to the city. So you got all the all the objects here, and, and we managed to get that up from 25 to 35 frames. So 10 FPS gain under 
under a hard conditions and like a 20 FTS gain there under the lighter conditions. Um, same thing here with, um, uh, with uh, AMD. All right, and if you are a member of the Mac team, you are probably wondering, well, um, does Metal do any better? And Metal actually is also a, a, a very big improvement um, on the Mac. And what I want you to look at here is, this is inverse. This is not frame rate. This is the time of milliseconds the CPU spends on rendering a frame. So the lower the graph, the better, because it's faster. So not only is the graph on average a lot lower, but what you need to pay particular attention to are those spikes in the OpenGL graph. So every one of those spikes is a frame that suddenly and unexpectedly takes a very long time. So these spikes in the graph, this is when you fly a curve and you're looking at a new area and then it takes a takes a half a frame or a, um, a half a second to get something new to display and you get this stutter as you turn, turn along. So those spikes in the time graph, that is stutter. And those spikes are all but gone down here in the bottom graph. So OpenGL driver, we have no idea how long it takes to do certain things and XPen cannot work around this. And this is the big improvement of Vulkan. Here you have a scatter plot of OpenGL rendering again. It is the time, so higher is worse. And Vulkan down here, the frame time consistently lower, consistently higher FPS. But what you need to pay attention is those red dots up here. Every red dot up here that is not connected to down here represents a frame that took significantly longer and this is what you experience as stuttering. Stuttering is the FPS seem kind of okay, but it still doesn't feel right because every now and then you get those hiccups. And those are what those dots are. And with Vulcan they are gone. All right, so let's talk about compatibility. So XPay 1150 will ship in two versions, the OpenGL version and the Vulkan slash metal version. And of course, the OpenGL version will just work with all your add-ons. It will not change anything. And the Vulkan uh, metal version can run any scenery add-ons, any airports, and any aircraft that do custom drawing in the cockpit, like all your screens and EFIS and glass displays and FMS and all the UI that you use, like your tablet to change the load out, change the weight and balance <coughs> and stuff. So all this stuff runs on Vulkan completely unmodified. The developer of the aircraft does not need to do anything to be compatible with Vulkan. So the only things that are going to have uh, problems porting over to Vulkan that we just can't take over ourselves are add-ons that do their own drawing in 3D, like certain um, uh, silver lining or weather engines or stuff like that. So this is uh, a high-end add-on, the Tolis A319, very, very sophisticated Airbus model with completely custom drawn cockpit and that just runs on Vulkan without any changes. It just just put it in works. So really, really nothing to do there for, for the third party developer. So is it done? So the only thing that's left, the only thing that uh, is really, really left to do is texture paging. So right now, Vulkan works really good if you have lots of VRAM. And if you don't have enough VRAM, it just crashes. So, I mean, we could have said, hey, minimum requirement from tomorrow on 16 gigabytes of VRAM to send you off, and we would be fine. Uh, no, what, what, what's still left to do is texture paging. So what you can imagine is this over here is like your four gigabytes of VRAM and your graphics card, and this is your 16 gigabytes of system memory. And when you tilt your head and you look over and there's the, the aircraft carrier or the oil platform over there, what you need to do is well, this stuff is ready to use, but the aircraft carrier is over here. So what we need to do is we need to get the aircraft carrier over to the graphics card. So we select the stuff that we no longer need, swap that out, then we're going to pick the aircraft carrier and put that over there. In OpenGL, 
this was just done by the driver like it worked magic just in the background but the problem was you had no idea when it was going to happen and how long it's going to take so those just in time pages just might cause the sim to stutter and wait until this thing is done and with, with Vulkan, we have complete control over what is going on there. So the goal there is to have everything ready in a low resolution in VRAM. And then as you look around and you need higher resolutions of things, transparently swap out the stuff that is on the GPU with higher resolution versions. So you're always going to see it and it's never going to wait. It's never going to stutter while loading. It's just going to increase the resolution when you look at things. And that is really the only Vulcan thing that is not completely done yet. So the schedule is the developers uh, will get the preview definitely this year. We are, we are very close, close to it. We are also want to run the public beta open to everyone also this year uh, in 2019. But we are almost definitely not going to reach the final version in 2019 because we expect the beta to last quite a long time until all the kinks with all the, um, the add-ons are, are worked out. So, I guess you are uh, going to get your hands on it pretty soon, but expect that it will take a while until all your stuff works with it. Alright, so to wrap this up, we're shipping Glomo, it's in closed beta right now, and it's going to be open beta pretty soon. x 1140 with all those great physics changes and weight turbulence and all those improvements is in beta right now, you can get it right now. Uh, developer preview of Vulcan is in the works, and within this year we'll also have a public beta. Uh, the developer tools are constantly updated, so we're doing Word Editor 2.2 beta right now. Uh, we got the blender converted so everyone who does models and uh, 3D models for aircraft is no longer stuck with an age-old blender version but they can uh, use uh, 2.7 now and we got 2.8 in the works very very close to finished also. Alright, I'm at the end of my prepared material now. I thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, I'm going to open it up for Q&A now for a couple of minutes that we have. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I got a hand over there. Hey, uh, like okay. what up? The weight turbulence. Yeah. Is that is that only with AI traffic you had on your sim, or does that represent? FSK on uh, edge. Right, right. Video. So right now it is only the AI airplanes that the sim generates itself because the wave turbulence is based on the physics that is run on the AI aircraft. So the AI aircraft, AI aircraft runs the same physical model of the air over the wings yeah. as a user airplane and that's what it allows it to generate the physically correct weight turbulence. So what we need to add is we need to give people from Batson or Pilot Edge the possibility to inject like how heavy is the plane, what's the angle of attack, and probably some information on how efficient the wing is, and then we can so generate the that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I think what we need is the right the the, the um those, those three parameters I, is, I think, what is needed, like weight of the plane, angle of attack, efficiency of the wing. And if we can get that from BATSIM or IVEO or Pilot or whatever you are flying, then I think we could generate the weight turbulence for other objects as well. Do you actually know what that would do to world flight? Hmm? World flight would go on and on because we won't be able to get out of the airports. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I think in an early uh, beta version, the weight turbulences were very aggressive. So if you flew, uh, if you had a 737 uh, taking off and you flew behind it in, in the 172, at one point the 172 would just explode and blow up. But I, I think this has been fixed now. Oh, hopefully. hopefully. All right, got another question down here. Uh, will Vulcan and Metal be together or, well, Vulcan first and Metal following? 
Uh, as far as I know, right now they are at feature parity. So they are really at the same feature level. So I don't think we're going to split it over into two betas. I th it's probably going to be the same, uh, the same beta. Yeah. All right. Uh, more questions over there. Yeah, yes, please. We support SLI. Uh, that is a question I can't answer because I don't work on the Vulkan port. I don't know. You would have to ask Ben. All right, back there. Um, you, you were saying the OpenGL uh, app store needs to be modified to work on Vulkan. Right. Is that because it shares the same syntax? Um, well, that is because there's a shared context. So there's a there's a um, so Xplain runs in a Vulkan context, and Xplain also opens up an OpenGL context that it loads the plugins into, and then it shares the panel texture and the UI and everything into. And and uh, so the the everything that happens in in 2D, like all the things on the panel, the EFIS, the glass display, the nav display, all of that stuff happens in an OpenGL context that the plugins run in, and that is connected to the Vulkan context of x -Plan. And it works well, as, as you said, as long as the, the plugin is drawing in 2D, it just works without changing anything. Yeah. <coughs> All right, one question? So flight model uh, improvements, will those require the experimental flight model checkbox, or are those going to be just in 11 14? So the, the, the goal of the flight model changes is to not change existing planes that don't have the box checked, right? So if you are, uh, uh, if you have a, uh, a sophisticated add-on that absolutely was tuned to the numbers on the old flight model, then 1140 will not change anything. If it does change something, it's probably a bug, and we want to know about it. And to get the the new effects from the helicopter, the rotor bounce back, the the um, the. Um, the uh, downwash, the delayed downwash, then you need to check the box for experimental flight model. So our recommendation is for, um, for third party developers to start running their things internally and testing it on the experimental flight model um, to, 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 to see what they need to tune. But for the end user who is flying a sophisticated add-on, they should probably not just check the experimental flight model because the add-on might not be ready for it. Yes. Okay, I think that I think that wraps it up. Thank you so much. Thank you.